ओम भूरभुव स्वहत स्वितुर्वरेण्यम भर्गो देवस धीम दियो यो न प्रचोदया तो शांति 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 नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज द ट्वेंटी वीडियो ऑन साई गीता इट स्टार्ट विद बाई देयर एक्शन पीपल विल रिवील देयर इनर नेचर्स इट इज इन द फील्ड ऑफ एक्शन और कर्मा दैट यू मोस्ट पेटेंटली रिवील योर कैरेक्टर एंड द टाइप ऑफ ह्यूमन बींग यू आर दैट्स वाई सो मच इम्पोर्टेंस हैज बीन गिवन टू परफॉर्मिंग ऑल योर एक्शन विदाउट अटैचमेंट टू द फ्रूट्स just as a mirror can show you the type of face you have your actions will reveal the type of inner feelings you have when you have some dealings with others you can easily find out the type of people they are by examining their actions people may appear to be very fair to be serene and mild and have a very peaceful disposition in other words they appear to have a satvik nature they may also appear to be individuals ready to undergo great personal sacrifice <coughs> you may believe that they are blessed with a sacred heart but their actions may prove them to be otherwise their actions may be totally devoid of love and compassion and true caring and consciousness of others their actions may reveal an animal nature or even a demonic nature through their actions their hidden nature is revealed other people by the outer impressions they first make may seem to be cruel you may feel that they are curt and abrupt and lacking in civility or gracious manners they may appear in every way to be very rajasic or even tamasic the lower animals like qualities previously discussed but if in their actions people exhibit compassion and other great human qualities then you must conclude that they are truly satvic in nature so if you want to ascertain whether a particular person is predominantly satvic rajasic or tamasic in nature whether his inner being is serene or and selfless or desire ridden and quick to react negatively or slothful vicious and mean then you need only to observe his actions people's actions will unmistakably reveal their inner nature the gita has pointed out the type of actions that should be performed in daily life the gita has not commanded you to renounce everything take up sanyasa by which is mean that you detach yourself from all worldly possessions and interest and go to the forest rather the gita has shown that an important duty and a responsibility of every human being is to undertake useful activities in the world furthermore the gita proclaims that the secret secret of human life is to recognize and follow the path of dharma which means engaging yourself in selfless and sacred actions that promote the welfare of your fellow human beings the gita declares that human life lies in action you should not even be able to sustain the body if you abstain from all actions therefore every ordinary human being as well as every spiritual aspirant should enter the field of activities and work but the actions which you perform must be sacred actions they must conform to the principle of dharma you have to convert your activities into karmas which are useful to others you have to perform actions which are ideal and you have to practice such ideal actions without any selfish motive they must originate not from the compulsive drive of desire but from the peaceful qualities in your heart devoid of self interest and attachment to the fruits 
only then can you can your actions be considered sattvic in nature ordinary people will not be able to perform actions completely without a desire you will have to orient your actions and your desires towards the purpose of seeking and experiencing god when that sacred orientation becomes the basis of all your activities then your karma becomes a yoga that will lead you straight on the path to your goal of becoming one with the divinity the spell of illusion and its two powerful forces however involved with all your actions there will be the spell of maya or illusion which will frustrate your efforts to reach your divine goal there are two powerful forces which make up maya these are the veiling power and the projecting power there is no particular form or shape to these two first consider the veiling or covering power how does it cover with what does it cover how can you uncover this thing which it has covered if it does not have form itself by what means does it cover how can it be removed these are all questions that cannot be answered maya is mysterious and inexplicable delusion and confusion are its very nature consider a rope lying on the road in the darkness you are deluded into believing that this rope is a snake what is it that has covered the rope try to understand what happened you were suddenly filled with a feeling of fear because you imagined a snake lying on the road before you so it was in your mind that the rope got converted into a snake and you got frightened is the snake really there no there is no snake there then how can the rope be converted into a thing which does not exist and never has existed this is the delusion under what circumstances does this delusion exert its influence on you it is during twilight or in the dark that you imagine you see the snake when there is only a rope there it is through darkness that the delusion comes and envelops you in truth no snake has replaced the rope but the delusion declouds the minds of human beings and obscures their clear perception this delusion is maya when you shine your light on the area you find no snake there there is only a rope lying there thus in the light a delusion disappears and the real object is seen that which exists will always exist it will never cease to exist it remains unchanged forever there cannot be even the slightest variation in its existence it is only the delusion affecting it which comes and goes the form that this delusion takes in the mind is the second powerful force of maya the projecting power which superimposes imaginary creations and objects on the unchanging basis in this case the projection was the snake another time it will be something else moods pains pleasures all come and go they are something like relatives that come to visit you but do not stay permanently in the same way the maya comes and goes as a delusion for human beings the delusion in your mind which covers the rope and hides it from you is the veiling power the illusion which has been projected by your mind on to the rope is the projecting power with the help of the light you see the rope as rope and the snake vanishes so these two aspects of maya have come in the darkness and have disappeared in the light the power of maya to delude can be permanently dispelled do these two powers of illusions always come at the same time or can they come at different time the veiling power and projecting power may appear and disappear at the same time but as happens in deep sleep when there is only the veiling power they may appear and disappear at different times also 
Maya is inexplicable. It has no beginning, but it can permanently come to an end. When the light of wisdom shines on it, Maya will finally disappear. Then the one unchanging reality will stand revealed. By teaching this great wisdom to Arjuna, Krishna was able to free him from delusion and helped him shine with the inner light. Then as now you are developing only superficial understanding and outer vision, but it is the inner vision that is important. It alone is true and sacred. You lose sight of the one reality of your own truth because you pay attention only to the impermanent outer vision and completely forget the permanent inner vision. God's mission is to restore this sacred inner vision. This is what he does when he comes as a avatar. Krishna said, Dear one, whatever actions you perform during the time you are on this earth, know that they are all impermanent. In time, you will discover that everything in this world is temporary. Your relationships, your attachments, your accomplishments, the sense of individuality you have developed are all going to disappear. Everything gets washed away in the flow of time. If you try to catch hold of things and cling to the things which are themselves being carried away by this flow of time, what chance is there for you to be saved? What chance is there for you to reach that perfection which is forever unaffected by this flow and which not only is never subject to it but is always its master? Arjuna, the things you are holding on to are all being washed away. Develop the firm conviction that in att attaching yourself to temporary things you are wasting your life, that you are wasting the sacred opportunity that has been given to you to reach the permanent state that is your true reality. Surrender yourself to the divinity, hold on to that permanent entity always established in your heart and you will surely gain the eternal joy, the bliss divine. If your heart is free of attachment and illusion, in this way Krishna urged Arjuna to free himself from the attachments and illusions that were confounding him. Krishna said, Arjuna, you yourself must purify your heart and remove the veil of ignorance that is declouding you. Take to the path of righteous action, work for the welfare of the world, and dedicate every act to me, your very self residing in your heart. There is no royal road for human life leading to spiritual awakening other than through Karma Yoga. Through the path of sacred action, you will be able to enter the path of devotion only after you have laid a firm foundation through good actions and only after you have purified your feelings and developed your devotion will you be able to enter the path of wisdom and proceed on to the highest level of God realization. It is in the arena of action that you lay the groundwork for reaching up to the loftiest regions of the spirit or plunging yourself down to the lowest depths of sorrow. Your good or bad circumstances are inextricably linked with your actions. As part of your activities, you must perform the various script scripturally prescribed sacrifices and ceremonial rituals. But as previously mentioned, this can take you only up to heaven. Krishna informed Arjuna that there was a state which was far beyond and far more sacred than heaven. Do not consider heaven as a, a permanent place. Krishna said, when you have exhausted your merits, you will have to leave heaven and return to earth. Heaven is only a temporary camp. You will not be able to reside there permanently. Perhaps you think that in heaven you will be able to enjoy so many bodily and mental pleasures. But in truth, the pleasures you get there are only a little greater than those you get here on earth. There is a state which is far, far beyond far more sacred. That state may be reached by identifying yourself with God, by associating yourself with the Atma. 
by merging your self small individual self with your highest eternal self in order to attain this state you will have to become totally desireless and selfless you will have to perform all your actions without expecting any fruits from them actions without attachment to the fruits whenever you perform an action there will always be a consequence a resultant fruit from that effort however there is no rule that says that you alone should enjoy the fruit of your actions a grandfather might have planted a seed which subsequently developed into a fruit tree and this grandfather might have died before the tree produced any fruit but the fruit of the tree might have been enjoyed by his grandchildren sometime later here is a case where a person performing an action did not personally enjoy the fruit but some others had the chance to enjoy them the grandfather might have knowingly planted the tree without ever expecting to enjoy the fruit he undertook the task originally with their broad minded view that uh, the tree in the courtyard will would give fruit to the generations who came along later fruit which would be greatly enjoyed by them and so the fruit of his broad minded action was reaped by succeeding members of his family with what motive did the grandfather plant this particular tree he might have done it with the slightly selfish motive that it would give enjoyment to members of his family but the selfishness that comes from doing everything only for your own enjoyment is much baser and meaner than this grandfather's slight tinge of selfishness the inner urge which leads you to undertake actions which are primarily for the welfare of others is always greater and nobler than the narrow feeling that lead you to act completely selfishly self selfishly expecting to derive all the benefits of your actions only for yourself in this sense the grandfather jackson must be considered far superior to that of an individual who acts only for himself but clearly there is an even greater action one that goes beyond all selfish considerations that is when you perform an action as an offering to god that is the greatest of all actions and that that is what you should strive for you should endeavor to perform all your actions selflessly and disinterestedly offering them to god without expecting to reap any of fruits such action is truly yoga from ordinary actions to buddhi yoga to karma yoga using your intellect to pl- uh, plan out an action the fruits of which would benefit someone else as was the case of the grandfather planting a tree that was enjoyed by future generations of his family can be called buddhi yoga in buddhi yoga you inquire into the consequences of your actions and thereby base your actions on the reasoning power of your intellect intellect goes far beyond the narrow selfish considerations of the lower mind and the senses but even here there is still a tinge of selfishness when you are completely free of all selfishness totally indifferent to the results acting effectively and with full concentration but without any attachment or desire and offering all your actions to god then you are practicing karma yoga that is far superior to buddhi yoga such a high state is not easily accessible to ordinary people but that does not mean that you should give up trying to attain it with whole hearted effort and with god's grace seemingly impossible things can be achieved if you persist in your efforts then with practice you will be able to reach this high level of karma yoga in all your activities to succeed in this the inner vision must be developed in order to firmly establish that inner vision you must keep a particular principle constantly in mind it is this no matter how hard you search whether it be in the this physical world or in the world of your dreams and imaginations or any other world 
all you will ever see whenever you look wherever you look will be combinations and variations of the five elements either in their gross or subtle forms they are the only things you will ever be able to find anywhere there can never be anything else there is no such thing as a sixth element these five elements are all reflections of the unlimited effulgence of god they are his aspects their basis is the one divine principle therefore perform all your actions with full consciousness regarding all objects in the world as the different multifarious names and forms that they appear to be but as a mere combinations of the five elements energized and illuminated by the one divine principle when you know that when you see everything in the world to be sacred manifestations of a divinity then all your actions will automatically become offering to god by keeping such lofty ideas in view while performing your actions you effectively turn your vision from the limited outer vision to the liberating inner vision and thus become a sacred human being constantly reflecting in this manner on the divinity that is everywhere is the best way to develop the inner vision that will establish you in karma yoga but such inner vision is very rare among people even the greatest pandits and scholars are steeped only in the outer vision here is a story that illustrates this astavak at the assembly of scholars once upon a time king janaka called an assembly of great scholars noted academicians participated famous pandits and logicians came from all over the realm scholars of renown who were extremely articulate in their arguments streamed in a number of highly gifted persons who were capable of impressing the whole world with their intellectual and verbal prowess came to the great hall of the palace where the assembly was being held this assembly was composed of such giants and there was no room at all for ordinary people to enter here is a story that illustrates this astavakra at the assembly of scholars <clears throat> once upon a time king janaka called an assembly of great scholars noted academicians participated famous pandits and logicians came from all over the realm scholars of renown who were extremely articulate in their arguments streamed in streamed in a number of highly gifted persons who were capable of impressing the whole world with their intellectual and verbal prowess came to the great hall of the palace where the assembly was being held this assembly was composed of such giants that <clears throat> there was no room at all for ordinary people to enter the daily meetings were presided over by king janaka himself of the highly select groups in attendance only the most outstanding and accomplished were given an opportunity to speak and present their views into this magnificent and august assembly young astavakra a young boy with a hideously deformed body sought to gain admission but who would permit astavakra to enter he did not have any credentials or any recommendation whatsoever he did not have the help of any great teacher or sponsor the only help he had was his deep faith in god <clears throat> whoever has an abiding faith in god will not be put to any insurmountable ins difficulties temporarily there may be some obstacles but in the end he is sure to meet with success but 3 days astavakra waited at the gate of king janaka's palace through which all the participants to the great assembly entered there while waiting astavakra observed all the world famous scholars 
who were coming to attend the meeting although only recognized scholars were being allowed inside Ashtabhakra was not prepared to give up his resolution to join the assembly and participate in its deliberations. I too have a chance, he said to himself, and continued to wait patiently at the gate day after day. There was one observant and sympathetic old scholar who noticed Ashtabhakra standing by that gate. Whenever he, ent whenever he entered and exited through it morning and evening, the kindly old scholar informed King Janka of the boy's presence. He told King Janka that there was some standing out, uh, outside waiting for days to enter the assembly, although he did not have any of the usual qualifications necessary for being permitted inside. He told the king that this was not an elderly scholar nor even a middle-aged one, but a very young person who did not seem to have much experience and who did not wear any of the accepted marks of achievement in scholarship, nor was he personally recommended by any of the pundits present. In short, nothing was known of this person or his qualifications, except that he had been continuously waiting to come inside. King Janka <coughs> directed his attendants to find the boy who uh, attendants to find the boy who was waiting at the gate outside and to bring him into the assembly hall. Shortly after King Janka had taken his seat and meeting began in the solemn and sacred atmosphere befitting such an august assembly, Ashtavakra entered the hall. The moment they saw this young boy with such a crooked form came to take part in the assembly, most of the great scholars who had gathered there began to laugh. King Janka, who was keenly observing Ashtavakra as he entered, he did not laugh. Ashtavakra carefully looked around the hall and then quite inexplicably started laughing even louder than the scholars who were seated there. This loud burst of laughter from Ashtavakra was quite inadmissible and greatly surprised the scholars. It became a real problem for them. Why should this young scamp be laughing at us, they thought. There certainly is reason enough for our laughter, considering how funny he looks. But there is nothing at all strange about us. So, what conceivable reason does he have for all this laughter? They were disturbed and irritated by what they considered the boy's impertinence. You find this to be rather common experience in the world that when ordinary people see someone who has a physical defect which gives him a crooked appearance or makes him appear strange or unusual, they are inclined to laugh. Such gross behavior can only be considered a sign of ignorance. It is totally different from the warm smile of an innocent child. A small child will smile at any person regardless of their appearance. When the child smiles, every other person seeing this child will also smile along with it. Such a child's smile which infects everyone who sees it arises from the sacredness of innocence. But in that assembly hall, the laughter that Astavakra met with was very different from a child's innocent smile. That hall was packed full with very great and noted scholars, persons of exceptional accomplishments in the learning. But there was no childlike innocence to be found there. The assembled scholars were eagerly waiting to find out why this strange-looking young lad who had just come in was laughing so loudly. 
One of the scholars was bold enough to speak to Astavakra. He asked, Young stranger, who are you? We do not know you. When we looked at your, as you came in, your form made us laugh. In response to our laughter, you are laughing, you are laughing even more loudly. What is the reason for this? What is so ludicrous? about all the renowned scholars seated here and that you have not stopped laughing even for a moment. Without inner vision they were shoemakers, not scholars. Astravakra replied, I entered this gathering thinking it to be a sacred assembly convened by the famous Emperor Janka to discuss the holy scriptures. If only I had known what kind of people were attending this assembly, I would, not, I would not have bothered to come. I waited patiently for many days and then entered this hall thinking that the greatest living scholars would be assembled here. I looked forward to being in the company of such sacred souls, but alas, I find nothing but common cobblers here. Only shoemakers who stitch sandals and work with leather. When they heard this, all the scholars became furious, feeling deeply insulted by the Ashtavakra for using such abusive words. But Ashtavakra continued in the same vein. Cobblers is the proper word to describe you. Only cobblers only, people who work with hides, would think about the worth of a particular skin. Others will not be bothered about it. All of you are laughing at my skin and have obviously decided that it is not worth much. But not even one of you has made any effort to know my spiritual understanding. Pandits would have the capacity to look into inward but you only seem to care about the outer covering. If you have not developed your inner vision, but you are concerned with the superficial outer vision, then you cannot be considered scholars at all. Then you are only cobblers, shoemakers, specialists in hides. Thus spoke Astavakra. The scholars hung their hands, heads in same. King Janka, who understood very well what Astavakra was saying, invited him to take a seat in that assembly and subsequently bestowed numerous honors upon him. As was the case then, so is the case now. Throughout the world, however great people may be, they have developed only the external vision. They do not bother to cultivate the inner vision. When you examine a person, you pay attention to his physical features, his wealth, his status, his education and degrees and so on. On the other hand, when God examines a person, he looks at the purity of his heart. He pays attention to the peace that, that is within him. You should also develop such inner vision and inner peace. Whatever be the circumstances, you should not be subject to quick excitement. You should allow time for the nobler feelings to develop from inside you and manifest themselves. Let all the poisonous emerge without interference. Suppose someone insults you, what will you lose by their insult? You should not respond to such insult with any hesitation or excitement. If you remain peaceful, all the anger of the other person may freely pour out. But if you try to obstruct others' strong feelings by preventing them from venting their anger, it could possibly lead to a dangerous situation. Consider as an example that someone has become sick, that is feeling quite nauseous and is throwing up the contents in his stomach. What is the reason for his being sick and vomiting? It is because some impurities, some toxic substances have entered his stomach. Wherever there, there are impurities, you will soon find germs or poisons and along with them come sickness and diminution of health. 
For this reason, it is most important that no impurities enter your system. The body is carefully arranged to immediately throw up and expel any toxins that attempt to enter it. When the body reacts naturally by vomiting out the poisons, it would be incorrect to give medicine to stop that vomiting. If medicine is given, the toxins will not be thrown up, instead they will remain in the stomach and soon poison the whole system. Therefore, one should allow all the impurities to come out and not obstruct them by giving medicine which suppresses the nausea. After all the impurities have been thrown up, then one can give some healing medicines. <coughs> Once the vomiting and nausea are over, a person will feel very weak. Then he will be, then he will do whatever you ask. That is when he will obey you. So this is the best procedure to follow when someone is vomiting out poison. The same thing applies whenever someone is very angry and is vomiting out poison in that form. Let them do it. Do not obstruct them. Whatever they want to say, let them say it, it as long as they want to. Until such time as it all come out, you should remain peaceful and patient. Why should you subject yourself to a lot of disturbance and excitement? Instead of becoming upset, your patient attitude will actually promote feelings of peace and happiness within you. This itself is the experience of heaven, namely, to maintain your equanimity and compassion under all circumstances. Why should you deny yourself the joy of such heavenly feelings? Patience is a most important quality. Of all the good qualities a person can have, patience and forbearance rank at the very top. Baba has said a number of times that forbearance is truth. Forbearance is righteousness, forbearance is non-violence, forbearance is happiness, forbearance really is equal in value to everything that you can find in all the worlds. If a person has forbearance, then he will be able to acquire all the other important qualities such as mind control, sense control, renunciation, fortitude, faith and equipoise. All these make up the state of inner purity. You use soap and water and powders and perfumes of various kinds to purify yourself externally. In the same way, you develop these six spiritual treasures and put them into daily practice in order to purify yourself internally. Inner purity is extremely important. It is even more important than outer purity. The Lord is ever present both inside and outside. The entire place where the Lord is to be found must be purified and sanctified, both inner and outer. Then the indwelling God will protect you wherever you go. The six spiritual treasures. Krishna taught Arjuna. All the qualities which make one an ideal person firmly established in wisdom, they have been previously mentioned, but let us examine them once again. They are <coughs> peace of mind, sense uh, second, sense control, third, renunciation of desire, fourth, fortitude under all circumstances. This means that whatever be the test, Whatever be the circumstances, you maintain a steady, undeluded and unwavering mind. Fifth, a firm faith in the teachings of the scriptures as well as in the words of Guru and the great saints who have trod the spiritual path before you. And sixth, being contented under all circumstances and have complete equanimity of mind. Only when you have equanimity of mind will you be able to develop firmness and fortitude. Only when you have fortitude will you be able to develop firm faith. Only when you have intense faith will you have some sacred feelings and renounced desires. Only when you have disgust for the objects of the world will you have sense control. 
then when you have achieved sense control you will gain the peace of mind where is peace of mind there is inner and outer purity and where there is inner and outer purity patience will be second nature to you and you will dwell automatically in that peaceful state therefore you must make an effort to develop these basic qualities which are so vital to progress on the spiritual path by reading or listening to these teachings on the gita or even committing various passages to memory you will not be able to achieve much along with these activities of the mind you have to put at least one or two of the injunctions given here in to practice only then will have given enjoying be put into practice by you so that they can become your inner treasure and be an integral part of your expression in all your day to day activities remove body consciousness realize god consciousness the world is filled with god saturated as it is with the divinity the world is also filled with karma or action karma is the power of creation the power of life it is a power directly derived from god you come into human birth in order to reap the fruits of your previous actions in that way actions lead to rebirth and then to more actions thereby keeping you bound to the cycle of birth and death to free yourself from this bondage should you engage in action or should you abstain from action the gita makes the answer clear the path to liberation is through karma through action but it enjoins you to turn all your actions into karma yoga sacred action which will take you towards union with god embodiments of love when the power of life takes on many festivations it becomes a body life which wears these various bodies has also been called karma the sanskrit word karma means work or action but karma refers only to the action itself but also to the cycle of action and reaction of work and its resulting fruits your body is formed on the basis of the karma or actions that you performed in an earlier life you get this human body and this life in order to enjoy or suffer the consequences of action that you were engaged in during another life the body is directly associ- associated with karma it has no meaning outside of karma body means karma and karma means body it is through the body that ever conceivable kind of action is performed the place and the time where these actions occur are within nature or the world when actions become sacred and righteous when they are selfless and of the highest purity and when they have been offered to god then they become yoga they lead to union with god so you can see that in action god man and nature all come together you perform action in order to sanctify your life everything in the world is the result of karma that is why the ancient wisdom teachings have declared offer your prostrations to karma whatever happens in is the consequence of some previous actions in other words the result of karma and be they good or bad be they virtuous or evil all karmas all actions are derived from the powers of god the expression may be different but in the deepest sense everything comes from god that is the reason why a yogi without caring whether it is favorable or unfavorable accept everything that happens to him as he, the will of lord and considers the performance of righteous actions as his primary duty the purpose for which you should be performing all your action is to sanctify your life 
it is only through god's grace that you gain the privilege to engage in righteous actions it is through the teachings of the lord that you get this sacred opportunity and direction it is for that reason that this holy scripture is called the gita gita means a song it is the song of the lord all those who listen to this song will be able to overcome grief and sorrow whether it be on the battlefield or on the some other field wherever this sacred song is sung grief and sorrow will be dispelled when actions are performed as offerings to god they become yoga this is revealed in the prayer given by a great saint who sang o oh, beloved lord you are the atma my very self my body is your house all my daily duties are my offerings to you my life breath is your praise wherever i walk i am circumambulate circumambulating you whatever word i utter is a mantra in adoration of you every karma i perform is done as worship around you this saint had purified every action performed by his sense organs and offered these actions to the lord thereby all his deeds became acts of worship when you transform your actions into sacred actions suitable as offerings to god then your actions will bring you into alignment with god they will become yoga you need to recognize the greatness inherent in such yoga and strive to purify every act you perform and offer it to the lord on the eve of the great war krishna commanded arjuna arjuna you must fight this war but while doing so think continuously of me and make every action pure and offer it to me that's what pleases me obeying the commands of the lord arjuna fought on the battlefield to preserve righteousness keeping krishna steady the in the in mind make all your actions as a sacrifice not a battle to reach your spiritual goals you need to obtain god's love in fact in fact for a devotee pleasing the lord is itself the goal it becomes your most important duty you must make sure that every act you perform will satisfy the lord krishna taught obey my commands and perform your duty in obeying the commands of the lord and fighting in this war arjuna's actions became a sacred yagna a sacrificial ritual which exalts the divinity and emerges one in the divine flow of grace in contrast there is a story in one of the epics of daksha who wanted to perform a yagna a ritual sacrifice however he disobeyed and disrespected lord shiva and he also violated the commands of the holy sages with a sense of egoism and attachment he commenced the sacrifice is egoism converted that sacrifice into a war you see that because Arjuna obeyed the Lord's commands and fought in the war his battle became a sacred sacrifice but for Daksha who performed his sacrifice in violation of the Lord's commands his sacrifice became a battle what is a war and what is a sacrifice all actions that are pure and selfless and performed as an offering to the lord become a sacrifice but actions which are undertaken in violation of the lord's command which are contrary to the scriptures and which are performed with a sense of egoism and pomposity uh, undertaken only for the purpose of promoting one's desires or hatred all such actions become a war even though the nature of the action may be that of a sacrifice when the anguish and hatred in a person takes form in words and these words in turn lead to arguments and counter arguments then a battle will soon ensue the root of all this is attachment and desire arising from identification with the body so here i end this video thank you my dear friends for watching and listening this video with 
पेशेंस थैंक यू नमस्कार माय डियर फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार